friends you know the buildings books temples and the education system do have a history but did you ever wonder that the clothing that you wear also is backed by an interesting history no right in this chapter we will see how clothing transformed over the years starting from the colonial rule let's find out more about clothing first we going to see about sumptuary laws during the medieval period in europe dress code were sometimes imposed through actual laws the dress codes were spelled out in detail through these laws people of france were expected to strictly follow the sumptuary laws from about 1924 to the time of french revolution in 1789 the sumptuary laws attempted the behavior of people who were considered as social inferiors they were prevented from wearing certain clothes consuming certain foods and beverages and hunting game in certain areas items of clothing were regulated not only by income but also by social rank expensive material like ermine fur silk velvet and brocade could be worn by only the royalty however such distinction ceased to exist after the french revolution let's consider effect of french revolution during the french revolution members of the jacobin clubs wear dresses without knee breeches The Jacobins were also called the sans culottes. People began to wear loose and comfortable clothes. Blue, white and red were the dominant colors of dresses as these colors symbolized the nationalism in France. Other political symbols also became a part of the dress code like the red cap of liberty, long trousers and the revolutionary cockade pinned onto a hat. Some tourist laws were not always made to emphasize social hierarchy. rather some of them were made to protect home production from imports for example velvet caps made with french imported materials were quite popular in 16th century england a law was passed to compel all persons over 6 years of age to wear woolen caps made in england on sundays and holidays this law did not apply to those at high positions this law remained in force for 26 years and was very helpful in building up to the english woolen industry even after the end of the sumptuary laws differences between social strata remained but difference in income now determined the way a person dressed people from different economic background develop their own clothing style based on the sense of fashion decency and practicality clothing style was also determined by gender differences while men were expected to be serious strong independent and aggressive women were expected to be delicate passive and docile from childhood girls were laced up and dressed in stays stay is a kind of support in a woman dresses to keep the upper body straight older girls had to wear tight fitting corsets wearing a corset mean inflicting huge pain on the body nevertheless Corsets were worn to maintain a slim waist which was considered ideal for women. How did women react to these norms? Many women believed that it was their duty to remain docile and graceful as per the prevalent social norms. They thought it was their duty to bear whatever pain and suffering they had to while maintaining a slim waist. Next one, reforms for clothing. However, things were changing over the 19th century. By the 1830s the English women began their agitation for democratic rights. When the movement for voting rights gained momentum, many also began a campaign for dress reform. Women's magazine described the problems associated with tight dresses and corsets. A similar movement developed among us the wild setters in America. Traditional feminine clothes were criticized on various grounds. It was argued that long skirts swept the ground and collected filth and dirt which was not good for hygiene. The skirts were voluminous and restricted movement. They prevented the women at workplace. Women felt that comfortable and convenient clothes would allow them to work and to earn. The reforms had to face a lot of ridicule and hostility in the beginning. It was argued that the women were losing their beauty. femininity and grace by giving up traditional dresses many women reforms changed back into traditional clothes as they faced persistent attacks however changes were more apparent by the end of the 19th century 
with the first world war many women began to work in factories they needed comfortable clothes which did not harm their work in the factories new materials for clothing came into use this development also changed the dresses let's see about new materials clothes made of flax linen or wool were difficult to clean and hence most of the ordinary women did not possess such clothes before the 17th century after 1600 trade with india brought indian chins into europe the indian chins was cheap beautiful and easy to maintain during the industrial revolution in the 19th century mass production of cotton textiles began in england this helped in making cotton clothes more affordable to a wider section of people in europe artificial fibers came into use by the early 20th century clothes made by artificial fibers were cheaper and easier to maintain consider about the war the two world war had profound impact on women's clothing many european women stopped wearing jewelry and luxurious clothes most of the women began to dress in similar ways and the difference between the upper class and the lower class blurred during the first world war clothes became the shorter because of practical necessity by 1917 over 7 lakh women in britain were employed in ammunition factories initially They wore a working uniform of blouse and trousers with the scarves. This dress was later replaced by khaki, overalls and caps. Sober colors replaced bright colors. As the war dragged on, skirts became shorter for the sake of convenience. Trousers became an important part of western women's clothing as they allowed greater freedom of movement. Women began to cut their hair short so that the hair could be easily managed. By the 20th century plain and austere dress was considered a symbol of seriousness and professionalism. The schools for children also emphasized the importance of plain dressing. Entry of gymnastics and games in the school curriculum for women also paved the way for comfortable and convenient clothing. Okay, let's see about clothing in India. During the colonial period, the influence of westernization could be seen on clothing among Indians. especially among the men the indians responded to the western style clothing in three different ways number 1 western dress many people especially men began to incorporate some elements of western clothing the parsis were among the first to adapt to western dresses they began wearing baggy trousers fenda that means hat along with long collarless coats boots and the walking stick completed the look of the gentleman Western clothes were seen as a sign of modernity and progress by some people. For some of the Dalit converts to Christianity, western dress was a sign of liberation. In this case, also it was men who adapted to the new dresses. Second one, traditional dresses. Some people thought that the western culture would lead to a loss of traditional culture identity. Such people preferred the traditional Indian dress. And the third one, combination of western and traditional some people preferred to use of a combination of western and indian dresses many people wear coats and hats along with the dhoti many others wore pagri along with the three piece suits many people wore western dress at their wake prayers but changed into the indian dress at home okay comes the next one caste conflict and dress change India had its own strict social codes of food and dresses which were based on the caste system. Some of the dress and food were strictly forbidden for lower caste people. Changes in clothing style often created violent social reactions because such change threatened the established social norms. The Shanars were the subordinate caste in the princely state of Travancore. The Shanar men and women were allowed to cover the upper body. During the 1820s the Shanar women began to wear tailored blouses after they were influenced by the Christian missionaries. The Nayars attacked the Shanar women in May 1822 for wearing a cloth over their upper body. The government of Travancore issued an order in 1829 to prevent the Shanar women from covering their upper body. But the conflict lingered on for a long period. After many years of conflict, the government finally passed an order which allowed the Shana women to cover their upper body, but not in a way the upper caste Hindu women do. Moving on to the next topic, British rule and dress codes. 
Specific clothing items often convey different meanings in different cultures. This can lead to misunderstanding and conflict. Let us take the example of turban and hat. For an Indian, Pagri was a sign of self-respect and the Pagri should always remain on the hood to maintain that self-respect. For a British, taking off his hat to show respect for someone was part of his culture. When an Indian did not remove his Pagri in front of a British official, it was considered as a sign of rude behavior. Let us take the example of shoes. Indians take off their shoes when they enter a place of worship. Many Indians also take off their shoes when they enter their homes. Some decorum was also maintained when someone visited a person of high authority. The British followed this practice when they visited a Raja or Shifain. But they also wanted the Indians to follow the same practice by entering a high office. But many Indians did not obey this rule because they felt that an office is a quite different from a home or a place of worship. See the next topic, designing the national dress. During the freedom struggle, many intellectuals began to design a national dress which could portray a pan-Indian identity. Rabindranath Tagore suggested a combination of Hindu and Muslim elements to design such a dress. The long button coat, that is Chapkan, was the result of such thought process. Nyanadanandini Devi, wife of Satyendranath Tagore, returned from Bombay to Calcutta in late of 1870s. She adopted the Parsi style of wearing the sari. She pinned the sari on the left shoulder with a brooch and wore it with a blouse and shoes. Her style was quickly adopted by the woman of the Brahma Samaj. This came to be known as the Brahmiga Sari. Moving on to the next topic, the Swadeshi movement. The Swadeshi movement began as a mark of protest to partition of Bengal in 1905. During the Swadeshi movement, people were argued to boycott British goods. The use of Kadi was promoted with much vigor. Women were asked to throw their silks and glass bangles. The changes to such calls were limited to upper class women because the poor could not afford Khadi. After about one and a half decade, even the upper class women resumed wearing the dress they previously wore. Next one, Mahatma Gandhi's experiment with clothing. Mahatma Gandhi probably used the symbol of clothing more powerfully than anyone else. All of us are familiar with the image of Mahatma Gandhi wearing a short dhoti and nothing else. Initially, Mahatma Gandhi thought of wearing such a dress for a short duration. But later he was convinced of the appeal of such powerful symbol. Mahatma Gandhi also promoted the use of handspan ghadi in order to promote the idea of Swadeshi. He even went on to attend the second round table conference in his trademark dress. But since ghadi was costly and difficult to maintain, it could not gain in popularity. Machine mold clothes from Manchester were cheaper and affordable to the masses. Most of the nationalist leaders preferred to wear traditional dhoti kurta or pyjama kurta, but those dresses were seldom made of ghadi. Some of the nationalist leaders like Jinnah and B.R. Ambedkar preferred western suits. For Ambedkar, wearing a suit was a sign of liberation from the age-old repression of the Dalits. The women leaders wore saris. Okay friends, this is the end of the chapter. Hope you, we are studying this chapter very well. We will meet again through another chapter. Till that, goodbye.